Vice Chair Arizon, would you like to um, call the meeting to order? Uh, definitely, definitely. Um, uh, we're going to call this uh, uh, this uh, uh, meeting to order. Um, and um, I guess we start with the the pledge, Luke. I think we're going to start with, uh, okay, thank you. I think roll call. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I, I apologize. I, I, I'm all over the place right now. Um, so you may know. Uh, 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 so, uh, <laughs> Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair Arison, uh, yeah, your first step yes. is you would um, you ask the clerk to call roll. So if you can okay. go, yeah, you can go ahead and ask the clerk to call roll. Okay, can we please call uh, uh, the roll, please? Good evening, Commissioner. This is the Transportation Safety Commission meeting called to order at 616. Vice Chair Francisco Arizon. Uh, here. Commissioner D. Aikman. Here. Commissioner Nicole Moore. Present. Commissioner Rudy Trujillo. Present. Vice Chair, want to call for Pledge of Allegiance? Uh, yes. Uh, now we uh, are going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Put your hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible and liberty and justice for all. I start a motion to approve the agenda. Yes, I'd like to make a motion yes. to approve the agenda. I second the motion to approve the agenda. Okay. Um, Roll call vote. Vice Chair Adison. Here. Uh, yes. Commissioner D. Aikman. Present. Commissioner Nicole Moore. Yes. Commissioner Rudy Trujillo. Yes. Vice Chair uh, Arison, the first uh, order of business is uh, the oath of office for our new um, commissioner. Uh, so, um, uh, would you like to uh, to take that on, uh, Maria? Uh, I, I'm trying to find the the uh, the agenda, and uh, I don't have it um, at hand. So uh, thank you for uh, the the reminder. Uh, we would like to uh, uh, have the oath uh, of our new uh, coming incoming commissioner, and we welcome them, welcome her with open arms. And uh, hopefully, uh, this doesn't discourage you. I, I normally am more prepared. I'm sorry, uh, but um, we would like for you to. Uh, we proceed with uh, the oath of office. Uh, Ms. Gomez, if you could please yep. raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. I, Adriana Gomez. Do solemnly affirm that I will support and defend. Do solemnly affirm that I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California and the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear the true faith and allegiance. That I will bear the true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. I will protect and serve the city of San Fernando. I will protect and serve the city of San Fernando. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. 
and I will and that I will well and faithfully discharge and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter the duties which I am about to enter congratulations commissioner Gomez thank you congratulations Adriana thank you congratulations does it matter that I'm still not on here we hear you D <laughs> but I want to see my picture <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same way. I can't. I can't see myself as well. Uh, I mean, tr I tried, but um, oh, for whatever the reason, it's not letting us here. So, uh, um, it, it, can I get a little help over there? Because, like I said, I can't find my agenda. Um, what do you need to know, Rudy? Motion to consider. No, that, that's Francisco uh, needs a copy of the agenda. Next item will be public okay. statements. Did Francisco, I sent you a text of a uh, shot of the agenda. Uh, you don't have my new number. <laughs> oh, okay. Commissioner Adison, Vice Chair Adison, next item is yes. public statements. Okay. Uh, do we have any public statements at this time? No, we do or not receive any, any public written, statements. No, no written public statements. No, we didn't receive any. Okay. Next item would I be a motion to oh. a motion to approve the consent calendar. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the, uh, the consent calendar? I'd like to make a motion on that that we approve the calendar. I'll second that motion. Roll call vote. Vice Chair Adison. Uh, uh, roll call uh, a vote, please. Vice Chair Adison. Yes. Commissioner Aikman. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Trujillo. Yes. Commissioner Gomez. Abstain. Next item is administrative reports. Um, I will go ahead and introduce this item uh, to our commission. Um, this is our uh, intended for our annual uh, reorganization of the commission. It's also timely with um, with the um, introduction of our new um, commissioner, uh, Commissioner Gomez. So um, we, if you have your agenda, we kind of walks through the steps that we take to uh, go through the election of a chair and vice chair. Uh, the current vice chair, Vice Chair Arison, uh, we, our, our chair, uh, Hernandez, stepped down, so we no longer have a chair, but our current vice chair would open up the nominations for the position of chair. Um, so if you can go ahead and call uh, call for the opening of nominations if you'd like, uh, Chair Arison, Vice Chair Arison. Uh, can we open them up uh, for nominations at this time for our, our positions here in the commission? So this is for the election of a new chair. Election for the new chair. Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner Trujillo, I'd like to um, uh, elect someone. If I may, even though uh, she's new to our chair, she's certainly not new to the commission uh, in the city of San Fernando, formerly being in Parks and Rec. I'd like to nominate Adriana Gomez uh, to be on the chair, if she would accept it. Um, I would accept. However, I feel that um, if there are other nominations, I would certainly concede to that. I'd like to nominate Rudy, uh, Pastor Rudy, because Pastor, Pastor Rudy. I think the first step is we need to see if there's a second for the nomination. Um, so we, we make a motion and then we have to second that uh, nomination. So if there's a second for the nomination of, of uh, Commissioner Gomez to be the chair. Okay, are there any other nominations uh, for chair? I'd like to uh, nominate uh, Pastor Rudy. I'll second the motion. 
Are there uh, any other nominations on the on the table? Okay, at this point, uh, Vice Chair Arison, um, if, uh, ask if, if there's no objections, you would make a motion to close the nominations now. Okay, if uh, commissioners, if there is no objection to uh, the nomination in the second year, uh, we will close the nominations for uh, chair. Well, there, there needs to be a motion and a second. I'll motion to chair the, I motion to close the nominations for chair. Second that. Okay, Maria, now you conduct a roll call vote of all commissioners to announce their vote for chair. For, um... No, there needs to be a second, so yeah. So right now uh, on the table, there's just, there's a, there's That's been one for that was motion. I'll second that. Uh, roll call vote for um, nominations for Pastor for Pastor Rudy Trujillo for uh, chair. Roll call vote, Vice Chair Arison. Yes. Commissioner Commissioner Aikman. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Trujillo. Yes. Commissioner Gomez. Yes. Congratulations, Chair Rudy Trujillo. Congratulations, my brother. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. So, uh, Chair uh, Trujillo, you now would take the lead as the new chair in opening the nominations for the position of vice chair. So we would go through the same process where we ask for uh, uh, nominations for the vice chair. Correct. I'd like to go ahead and open up uh, the uh, nominations for uh, vice chair at this time. Do we have any nominations? I'd like to nominate Adrian Gomez. I'll second the motion. And uh, Chair Trujillo, you, uh, you would ask if there are any other uh, any other nominations? Yes, absolutely. Do we have any other nominations for the vice chair? Okay, at this point, right. you would, yeah, you would make a motion to close the nomination. So at this point, I'd like to make a motion for us to uh, close it and take a vote, please. Nominations to, for Vice Chair Adriana Gomez, uh, roll call vote. Oh, sorry, we still need to have a motion and a second oh, to cl sorry. close the... I'll second it. He motioned. Yeah, okay, second. second. Thank you. Vice Chair nomination for Adriana Gomez, Chair Rudy Trujillo. Yes. Chair Francisco Arizon? Yes. Chair D. Aikman? Yes. Chair Nicole Moore? I mean, sorry, Commissioner Nicole Moore? Yes. Commissioner Adriana Gomez? Yes. All right. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Thank Not only you. welcome, but into the uh, vice chair. Thank you so much. I hope you can At join us next time. I will. I um, am flying out tonight. That's the only reason I was not able to join uh, in person. Okay, at this time, I'd like to uh, move on to our next item. Once again, thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate the uh, nomination and the confidence. Uh, thank you so much. At this point, what I'd like to do is have us go ahead and move forward. Um, uh, look like item one, request to approve meetings for the minutes. That was already done. So the reorganization, item two, uh, review of Rosenberg's rules of order. Do we have a review uh, for tonight? Yes, yeah, so I'll just introduce this item. And uh, essentially right now, w with the annual reorganization, uh, the commissions uh, uh, will be reviewing a video. It's, uh, uh, as it's stated in the staff report, it's, uh, we'll, we'll be here for a little bit. It's a 51 minute long video, but it's a review of Rosenberg's rules of order. These are the simplified procedures that cities, most cities in California and commissions use to conduct meetings. It's just a good opportunity after we do a reorganization, bring in a new uh, commissioner uh, to kind of go over these on an annual basis. So uh, tonight we'll be, um, 
uh, Chair Trujillo will be uh, playing the video, and then any discussion uh, that the commission would like to have afterwards, we would we would do that afterwards. So I do have a question: Are we able to actually have everybody view it, and then when we we um, on our next meeting is to go over any questions? Is that uh, something that we're able to do? Uh, yeah, so the video will be shared through Zoom, so you'd all be able to view it at the same time here. And then once we concluded, if there's any discussion that you'd like, you know, like to lead with with the commissioners, we would do it at that time. Okay, I guess my question was: Is are we able to? Is it mandated that we all view it at the same time, like within this reorganizational meeting? The intention is we would, uh, we, the, the, to have the commissions, when they review it, to review it together at the same time. I see. Okay. Uh, would this be a convenient time for everybody? I, I don't have a problem uh, with it. Fine with me. Okay. We approved right. the agenda, so. <laughs> okay. I just, that's why I'm just asking. Um, uh, let me see as I'm looking at the agenda. I just wanted to make sure to make sure that, you know, all of us can stay on for the next 51 minutes or so. Okay. Ready to move forward. Mr. Rudy, do you see the video on your screen? Uh, let me see. No. Can Let's see. Let me look for another spot here. Let's see. Okay. No. Uh, can you try again? See if it'll pop up. Okay. I do see it now. Yes. Okay. Unfortunately, I can't see it. I don't know why. Okay. I, I guess as long as he could hear it, would that be correct? Uh, I think I, well, it, it goes in and out. Uh, There's some, yeah. yeah. Is the video running at this time? Oh, we're just getting ready to start it, start it now. Oh, okay. So I, I, I am seeing that. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Rosenberg. Welcome to Parliamentary Procedure Simplified. I think you're going to enjoy this course, and I think you're going to get a lot out of the workshop. First of all, uh, as I said, my name is David Rosenberg. I am a judge of the Superior Court in California. But in my former lives, I served on a city council here in California. In fact, I served for 12 years, three complete terms, including two terms as mayor of my city. I also served on a board of supervisors for two terms, including two terms as chairman of the board. Prior to that time uh, and during that time, I also served as chairman or president of a number of organizations, boards, and commissions, including the California State Lottery. So I've had lots of experience, decades of experience, in chairing meetings and running meetings and with parliamentary procedure. Now, about 15 or 20 years ago, I started teaching this workshop called uh, Rosenberg's Rules of Order. And uh, it proved to be so popular that I kept being asked to teach it again and again and again. In fact, it's gotten so popular that I've had to create this uh, CD so that it can be spread among the uh, communities of uh, California and outside of California so that people can learn and appreciate not only how to run a meeting, but how to make a meeting very understandable, very user-friendly, not only to members of the body, but also to members of the public. Now, what are we going to learn today? First of all, as a result of this class, you will not feel overwhelmed by the complexities of parliamentary procedure. You will feel at home as an active participant at a city council meeting, at a board of supervisors meeting, or at any other meeting in which you are participating. And finally, if you are the mayor or the chairman or the presiding officer, you will feel comfortable with running that meeting. This course has been taken by uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of mayors, 
city council members, members of boards of supervisors, city clerks, city attorneys, county council, and other normal folks. And uh, I've uniformly received a lot of uh, comments in response, and I've structured this course uh, with those comments in mind. So I think you're going to find uh, what you're going to hear today to be very useful to you as you run or participate in meetings. Now, let's talk about rules. Um, what's the purpose of rules? Number one, rules should establish order. That makes sense. Number two, rules should be clear. Uh, otherwise, if rules are not clear, ultimately we wind up with two classes of people, those who know the rules and can follow the process, and those who aren't aware of the rules or don't know the rules and are kind of left out of the process. Number three, rules should be user-friendly. In other words, they've got to make sense. Uh, they've got to be uniform. You've got to apply the same rules to all people. And finally, and frankly, very importantly, rules have to enforce the will of the majority while protecting the rights of the minority. We are a democracy, and when all is said and done, the majority rules, and ultimately the body has to make a decision. So these rules will help us in that process. Now, before we get going and get too far along in this uh, workshop, I'd like to uh, work with you to do a little self-test. Now, th there's no pass or fail. Uh, we're not going to grade you. We're not going to score you. But I'm going to ask you 10 questions. And I uh, want you to answer these questions as best you can. Uh, and after you've answered the questions in your own mind, I'll give you the uh, correct answer, okay? So let's begin on the self-test. Question number one. You are a city council member at a meeting of your city council, and you can't hear the discussion due to noise being made by an ancient heating system. You should raise your hand and, when recognized, state, point of order, I can't hear what's being discussed. Now, is that true or false? What do you think? The answer? The answer is false. It's a bit of a trick question, but let me explain to you what I mean by that. Uh, this is not technically a point of order. It's a point of personal privilege. A point of order is when you raise a point regarding the parliamentary procedures. A point of personal privilege is an exercise of your right to be able to participate in a meeting, uh, but you're being restricted in that right because of some problem. Noise, heat, cold, something of that nature. So you can raise a point of personal privilege at, at any time. And finally, you don't have to raise your hand and wait to be recognized. If you're stating a point of personal privilege, you have the right to be heard right now. In other words, you can't hear what's going on uh, because of the fan or some other uh, uh, noise. And so you have the right to tell the chair of the uh, meeting, point of personal privilege, I can't hear what's going on. To question number two. A vote on a hotly contested agenda item number five has been taken, and it passed by a vote of three to two. You were one of the two votes against the item. But you just can't get the item out of your mind. Later in the meeting, you ask for reconsideration of item number five because you've thought of something which you believe will convince one of the majority votes to change his or her mind. The mayor rules you out of order and refuses to allow a vote on reconsideration. Now, is the mayor's ruling correct or incorrect? What do you think? Correct or incorrect? The answer, the mayor's ruling is correct. We'll get into this in our discussion of parliamentary procedure a little later in this workshop, but essentially, this is a vote for reconsideration. And reconsideration motions are a special bird. They're a special entity. You've got to deal with them differently. Not everyone can ask for a vote of reconsideration. Only a member of the majority can ask for reconsideration. Uh, and frankly, that makes sense. If a member of the minority could ask for reconsideration on a vote, you'd never finish with it. Ad, ad nauseum, you'd be dealing with reconsideration again and again and again. So only a member of the majority has the right to ask for a revote because they may have changed their mind. All right, let's go on to question number three. It's 11 p.m. When the city council reaches agenda item 25, the mayor asks for a show of hands 
of how many members of the public wish to speak on the item. And 32 people raised their hands. I'll bet you've been there before, ladies and gentlemen, right? The mayor announces that he will limit each speaker to two minutes each. Can the mayor properly do so? Yes or no? What do you think? Well, the answer is yes. The mayor may limit uh, the presentations by members of the public. In fact, you'll find that the mayor or the chairman or the presiding officer has extensive powers in a parliamentary procedure set up, and the mayor properly may limit public speakers and the time that they speak on an item. Question number four. Joe makes a motion to hold a city council retreat in May and Mary seconds the motion. Sally then moves an amendment to have the retreat in June and Fred seconds that motion. Esteban then moves a substitute motion to have no retreat this year and Fred seconds the motion. The mayor announces that discussion will first begin on the motion to amend. Is this correct? Uh, is this a correct ruling? The answer is either yes or no. Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? The answer is no. The mayor's ruling is wrong. When you have multiple motions on the floor, the rule of thumb is you always deal with the last motion first. And by the way, as a personal rule of thumb, I never allow more than three motions on the floor at one time. It just gets too darn confusing if you have four, five, or six motions on the floor. So limit it to three and go on from there. But the rule is you deal with the last motion first. In this case, you would be dealing with the substitute motion because that was the last motion on the floor. Question number five. On a hotly contested agenda item attended by many members of the public, the audience becomes very engaged in the discussion and members of the audience applaud in support or hiss in opposition following the remarks of the first speaker who addresses the city council. The mayor states that no vocal expressions of support or opposition will be tolerated at the meeting and asks the public not to applaud or hiss after speakers conclude their remarks. May the mayor do so? Yes or no? The answer? The answer is yes. The mayor may do so. The mayor may control uh, that sort of thing at uh, meetings. Now, it gets more complicated. Uh, people applauding or hissing, I think we all generally agree that uh, mayors may control that and say, you can't do that, none of that. No applause, no hissing, no booing. But what if uh, members of the public bring signs with them, S little signs, you know, eight and a half by 11 signs that say, support measure X. What if they bring big signs, banners? Uh, those are all questions we'll get into uh, later in this workshop, but they raise interesting questions of decorum on the one hand, free speech on the other. Question number six. A member of the city council continually interrupts other, mem other members of the council while they're speaking on agenda items. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you may have been there on occasion, right? The mayor refuses to stop the interrupting council member from interrupting. You, as a member of the city council, have the right to make a motion to challenge the ruling of the mayor and to have that motion voted on by the council. True or false, what do you think? The answer is true. This happens rarely, but this is a right that you have. The mayor has the next to the final say on everything uh, dealing with parliamentary procedure. The mayor, however, or the presiding officer, can be trumped by a vote of the body. You as a member of the body can challenge a ruling of the mayor by way of motion and you have the right to have that motion heard, debated, and decided by the body. If the motion passes, the ruling of the mayor is overruled. Good to know. Question number seven. After a very long discussion and debate on a motion you made and duly seconded to approve the street repair schedule you want to get on with the vote on the item, and so you say, I call the question. The mayor then says, okay, let's proceed with the vote on the pending motion to approve the proposed street repair schedule. Did the mayor handle your call for the question properly? Yes or no? Who thinks yes? Who among you thinks no? So the rest of you have no opinion, right? Well, in any event, the answer is yes. The mayor handled it properly. Technically, technically, ladies and gentlemen, 
It's a motion to cut off debate. When you say I call the question or I move the previous question, technically it is a motion to cut off debate and it requires a two-thirds vote. However, the mayor in this case treated it informally and I recommend that that is the better way to treat it. Uh, the mayor treated it as a request uh, to vote uh, based on the belief that there's no further discussion. So the mayor in this case looked to the left, looked to the right, kind of assessed that there was no further discussion uh, to be had and said, okay, let's proceed to the vote. Now, if the mayor in assessing uh, the situation felt that people still wanted to discuss the matter or if a member of the body said, no, no, I, I want to say a few things, then under those circumstances, the mayor should have treated it as a motion, a motion of the previous question that is essentially a motion to cut off debate. And again, we'll discuss that later in this workshop. Question number eight. If the maker of a pending motion accepts a proposed change and incorporates the change into his or her motion, and the person who seconded the motion also accepts the change, this is called a friendly amendment. True or false? The answer, true. It is in fact a friendly amendment, and it's a way to move things along without getting bogged down in a lot of motions and amendments. Uh, just accept it as a friendly amendment to the motion. If the seconder accepts it, then the motion is in fact amended, and you go on from there. Question number nine. Sam moves and receives a second on a motion to create a seven-member police oversight commission. Mariko moves and receives a second on a motion to make the police oversight commission 15 members. Helen moves and receives a second on a motion to create an ombudsman in lieu of a police oversight commission. The mayor schedules discussion and a vote on the third motion, that is Helen's motion, which passes. The mayor then should schedule discussion and a vote on the second motion, Mariko's motion. Is that true or is that false? What do you think? The answer, ladies and gentlemen, to question number nine is false. This was, in fact, a substitute motion. And when the substitute motion passed, it made the other motions, the original motion and the motion to amend, moot. That's why substitute motions and motions to amend are so different. And we'll discuss this in more depth as we get into the workshop. As you can see, I'm just piquing your interest here. Finally, question number 10. In the middle of the meeting, xenophobia, a member of the city council, is recognized by the mayor and moves to adjourn the meeting. Her motion is seconded by Frank. The mayor calls for discussion prior to the vote. Xenophobia raises a point of order and says that the motion should be voted on immediately. Who is correct? Is the mayor correct or is xenophobia correct? The answer, ladies and gentlemen, is xenophobia. Xenophobia is correct. This was a motion to adjourn the meeting. And believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, motions to adjourn are not debatable. Once they're made and seconded, there is no discussion they must be voted on immediately. Uh, I'm sure you all do this at your meetings on a consistent basis, but that's the rule. And later in this workshop, we will discuss what motions are debatable, what motions are not. We'll also discuss what motions require a two-thirds vote and what motions require a simple majority. And so that's a tiptoe through the tulips, ladies and gentlemen, of some of the items we'll be discussing in this workshop. Now, let's turn back to the PowerPoint presentation and talk about the role of the chair. I want to emphasize, ladies and gentlemen, the role of the chair is critically important to the process. It's critically important to a democracy. And so the chair's role is critically important in this presentation. What is the role of the chair? Number one, the chair must understand the rules. Frankly, the chair should understand the rules better than any member of the body. Number two, the chair moves the meeting and the agenda. This is a really important uh, rule. Uh, the chair has to move it along. We've all been at meetings where a chair sort of sits back and doesn't move the agenda along. Uh, and if that happens, the meeting drags, drives everyone crazy. On the other hand, 
A chair who moves things too quickly is almost as bad. You need to find the proper pace for everyone's comfort level. Number three, the chair, in my opinion, should take the lead role in process. Uh, not to say the chair isn't an important member of the body and plays a very important role substantively. The chair's vote is just as good as any other member's vote. However, in terms of the process, making sure the process is followed, making sure the rules are followed, making sure people, members of the body, and members of the public are treated fairly, it's the chair that we depend on. And finally, and this is hard for many chairs, but this is important, the chair should take a less active role in the debate. I recommend that the chair sit back, allow the other members to debate and discuss the issue, and then participate last. Have the final word, if you will. Now, don't underestimate the value, importance, and power of having the last word, the final word, in a debate. In fact, I think you will find very often that matters are contested and are often split two to two or three to three, however many members there are of the body. And then the chair, the mayor, the, the president has a critically important role because that person then is the decider. That person makes the final decision and moves the item forward. Let's talk about the basic format for agenda items. Wow. I have uh, created a little matrix, which you'll see in the PowerPoint, uh, which shows a 10-step process in dealing with each agenda item. And ladies and gentlemen, if you follow this 10-step process, I think you'll find the uh, process is fair uh, and understandable, and the item moves forward. So step number one, announce the agenda item. This is the role of the chair, and it's important. Uh, you need to announce at the get-go where you are. In other words, as the chair, tell the members of the body, tell whoever is taking the minutes, tell the members of the public. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now turn to agenda item 21, street tree re uh, replacement, or whatever the item is. Let everyone know where we are. So it's so important for the chairman the mayor, whoever's presiding over the meeting, to announce to the public, to the body, uh, to everyone, where we are. Number two, report on the item. This is when we ask for staff or the chairman of the committee, uh, member of the body, whoever is in charge, to give a report, a staff report, if you will, or a committee report. Number three, technical questions for clarification. This is when the presiding officer asks members of the body Ladies and gentlemen, do you have any technical questions of clarification? This is not a substantive debate. This is not a substantive discussion. This is clarification. This is where you need to get an item from the staff report clarified. Number four, public comments. I always like to put public comments as far in the front of the item as we can, and so we place it at number four. This is when the presiding officer opens it up to members of the public to express themselves, to tell the body what they think. The presiding officer is entitled to limit the time depending on how many people want to speak on the item. Uh, I always ask for a show of hands. Could I see a show of hands of those who wish to speak on item number 21? If three people raise their hands, I give them more time. If 20 people raise their hands, I limit the time. In fact, sometimes when a lot of people raise their hands, I create tiers of time. For example, I will give people one minute, two minutes, or three minutes. Uh, and I allow the one minute speakers to go first. So they line up and they speak for one minute. Sometimes they speak for 15 seconds. They just want to say, you know, I agree with jo what Joe said. So you can create uh, more time for yourself by creating tiers of time. One minute, two minute, three minute. After the public comment, you close the uh, public hearing. And as a matter of practice, I don't allow the members of the public to speak after that. Otherwise, the meetings go on just too long. I give the public their opportunity, and then the body has to have its opportunity. Number five, I invite a motion. This can be done in many ways. I can ask the body, may I have a motion? Another way is to simply say, uh, how about a motion to appoint a 15-member committee? 
In other words, you can suggest a motion. And when all else fails, you as the mayor or a presiding officer can make a motion if you feel so compelled. But I find it's best to have a motion on the floor uh, when you're debating and discussing so you know what you're debating and you know what you're discussing and you're much more focused. There are occasions where the body is very confused and so sometimes you want to have the discussion before the motion. But 95 times out of 100, ladies and gentlemen, it's best to have a motion on the floor. Uh, after the motion, number six, you want to have a second to the motion. In other words, you, you don't want something on the floor that only one person supports. You want to have at least two members of the body that have an inkling of support for that item. So you want a second. Number seven, you want to understand the motion. Now, what do I mean by that? It's important for the mayor to make sure everyone understands what is being discussed and debated. So you want to restate the motion. This can be done in several ways. One, the presiding officer, the mayor, whoever, states the motion. Or number two, the presiding officer can ask the maker of the motion to state the motion. Or number three, you can ask the secretary or whoever's recording to state the motion. However, you do need to state the motion at a minimum uh, before uh, the, uh, the vote, but hopefully before the discussion. Uh, number eight, you want to discuss and debate. I have a rule of thumb that I limit people's time. Uh, this is either done by uh, the rules of the body. Sometimes bodies have rules saying no more than 10 minutes or no more than five minutes. But you follow those rules, and if you don't have rules, you limit the time. Certainly limit the, the opportunities people have to discuss an item. In other words, don't let anyone speak to the item more than twice. And frankly, I follow a rule of thumb that I don't let a member of the body speak the second time until every member of the body has at least had an opportunity to speak the first time. Even if they don't exercise it, you give them the opportunity. Otherwise, you have members dominating the debate. And you don't want to do that. You want to give everyone an opportunity to discuss and debate the item. Uh, so after discussion and debate, you, number nine, take the vote. Um, this can be done in many different ways. Normally it's done by uh, a voice vote, but that's up to the chair. After the vote, number 10, very important, announce the vote. You would be amazed, ladies and gentlemen, how often that does not happen, but it's critically important that it does happen because the members of the body, the members of the public, and most importantly, the recording secretary need to know what you just did. Tell them what you did, tell them the vote. In other words, for example, you might say, the recommendations of the Street Tree Commission have been adopted by the body. The vote was three to two with Council Members Smith and Jones dissenting. It's important to identify who dissented so that the vote is clear. Okay? So that is the basic format for agenda items. Now let's take a look at how we count votes. Uh, this, ladies and gentlemen, can be trickier than you think, and it gets tricky when we start dealing with abstentions. How you treat abstentions really depends on the rules of the body. Do you count those abstentions as uh, votes of those present or votes of those present in voting? But let me give you some hypotheticals. Uh, let's turn first to hypothetical number one on the PowerPoint. Assume you're a member of a five-member city council. The vote required on a motion is a simple majority. We're not dealing with a two-thirds vote. We're dealing with simple majorities. Does the motion pass or fail on the following votes? Let's first turn to a vote of three yes and two no. Uh, that's simple. If the vote is three yes and two no, it passes, right? That's clear. Uh, how about if the vote is three yes, one no, and one abstention? Well, again, that passes. That's pretty clear. Uh, you've got uh, three yeses. That is a majority under anyone's uh, imagination and under anyone's stretch. Now, let's look at a vote of two yes two no and one abstain. Does that pass or does that motion fail? The answer is that motion fails because that's a tie vote. A tie vote cannot pass a motion. Tie vote always means the motion fails. 
Now let's take a look at a vote of two yes, one no, one no vote, and two abstain. Two yes, one no, and two abstain. Does that pass? Does that motion pass, or does that motion fail? Well, first of all, we do have a quorum. Uh, everyone's there. You have two yeses, one no, and two abstentions. So that's clearly a quorum. You look to the rules of the body, by the way, to determine what a quorum is. Normally, the rules of the body will say that a majority is a quorum. So for a five-member body, three members are a quorum. If you have three members, you can do business. Uh, but does it have sufficient votes to pass? The answer is yes. The motion passes on a vote of two yes, one no, and two abstain. Why is that? Because the abstain votes count for purposes of a quorum. When you're counting, do you have a quorum? However, for purposes of the vote, it's like they never voted. You don't count them for the vote. And so, if you consider that they never voted, the vote is two yes and one no. It passes. Now, let's take a look at a vote of two yes, one no, and two absent. Does that pass or does that fail? The answer is it passes. You still have a quorum. You have three members who are actually present. That's a quorum. And it's the same as the previous vote. Two yeses and one no, that's a pass. A majority has voted in favor of the item. Now let's take a look at a vote of one yes, zero no, three abstain, and one absent. Does that motion pass or fail? Again, let's look at a quorum. Do we have a quorum? Yes, we do. We actually have four of the members out of the five who are there. Three of them voted abstain, but they're there. So the quorum is present. Do we have enough to pass? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. It passes. Because the vote is one yes, zero no. It does pass. I actually had a situation like that occur on a, a city council I served on many years ago. Uh, one of the members of the body uh, made a motion to put someone on a planning commission uh, we had a kind of rule of thumb that we went along with individual member uh, motions on planning commissioners. And so we didn't like that person. We all kind of held our noses, uh, but we didn't want to vote no, so we just abstained. The vote was one yes, in this case, uh, four abstentions, and uh, the person got seated on the planning commission. And uh, just a wonderful member he was. Uh, finally, we have a vote of two yes, zero no, and three absent. Is that a pass or a fail? That, ladies and gentlemen, is a fail because why? Correct, no quorum. There is not a quorum present. Only two members of the five-member body are present. You don't have a quorum, you can't act. So that is uh, the, uh, uh, the rule uh, when you're dealing with abstentions. Now let's take a look at hypothetical number two. Assume you have a five-member city council and you vote uh, on a motion requiring a two-thirds vote to pass. In this case, it's a two-thirds vote to pass, not a simple majority. Which of the following votes passes or fails? And here you have uh, five different scenarios. Let's take a look at those scenarios. Here are the answers to hypothetical number two. First of all, three yes and two no. Does that pass or does that fail? That, ladies and gentlemen, fails. While it would pass if you needed a simple majority, it fails with a two-thirds vote. Uh, you need uh, two no votes. If you have two no votes, you need four yes votes to pass a motion. Just a rule of thumb to figure it out, every no vote requires two yes votes to overcome. And so in this case, when you have two no votes, you needed four yes votes. You only got three yes votes, it fails. The next scenario, four yes, one no. Does that pass? Yes, it does. We have a two-thirds uh, majority. There was only one no vote, so all you need is two yes votes to get a two-thirds majority. In this case, you had four yes votes, clearly a two-thirds majority. How about three yes, one no, and one abstain? Number one, you do have a quorum. And number two, you do have enough to pass that motion. 
so it does pass. Remember, the abstain votes, uh, you count them for purposes of quorum, but as far as the vote itself, it's like they never voted. Uh, the fourth scenario, you have two yes, one no, and two abstain. Does that pass or fail? Answer, it passes. Uh, two yes votes, one no vote, that is clearly a two-thirds majority. The two abstains count for quorum, but don't count for purposes of the vote. And finally, two yes, one no, one abstain, one absent. Does that pass? Answer, yes. Number one, again, you have a quorum. There's only one person absent. Four people are there. The quorum rule is a majority, normally. And you have two yes votes versus one no vote. That is a two-thirds majority. The abstain vote doesn't count. Let me give you hypothetical number three. Let's assume the same factors as hypothetical number two, except the vote required by the charter or the rules of the body is two-thirds of the members present at the meeting. Now, uh, here are the scenarios. There are five of them. You can see them in the PowerPoint. Let's go to the answers to hypothetical number three. Uh, you will find that the, the situation is a little different when the rules of the body say you count members present at the meeting because this is an exception to the rule on counting abstentions. If your local rules say that you count votes of those present, then in that case, you do count abstain votes. In that case, in that case, an abstention vote acts just like a no vote. So, looking at the five scenarios. First scenario, three yes and two no, it fails. You don't have a two-thirds majority, so that motion fails. How about four yes and one no? No vote, it, it passes, you have a two-thirds vote. How about three yes, one no, and one abstain? In that case, it fails, because in this case, the abstention counts as if it were a no vote, and you need two-thirds of those present. In this case, you have one no and one abstain, effectively two no votes, so you do not have a two-thirds majority. How about the next scenario? Two yes, one no, and two abstain. Again, it fails you still do not have a two-thirds vote. Uh, in fact, uh, you have the equivalent of three no votes with the two abstentions and the one no vote. Finally, you have the two yes, one no, one abstain, and one absent. There are four people present, uh, so we need three yes votes, and we just don't have it in this scenario, and so it fails. So let me show you a PowerPoint slide which uh, tells you how you count abstain votes. Here's the rule of thumb. The general and the default rule and the rule we apply in almost every case is that you count all votes that are present and voting. So that you do not count abstain votes. Members who abstain are counted for purposes of determining a quorum, but it's like the abstain votes on the motion don't exist. On the other hand, if the rules of the body specifically say that you count votes of those present, then you do count abstain votes, and in that case, an abstain vote acts just like a no vote. All right, enough about abstentions, enough about voting. Let's move on to motions. In this slide, uh, we see that we have three kinds of motions. Number one, we have the basic motion. Number two, we have the motion to amend. And number three, we have the substitute motion. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, I move that we set up a finance committee of seven members to audit uh, the uh, city manager's office. That's the basic motion. Now let's assume someone makes the following motion. I move uh, that we may, uh, amend that to have a finance committee of 10 members to audit the city manager's office. That's a motion to amend, because what that does is it changes the basic motion. Now let's assume someone makes the following motion. 
uh, I move that we hire a CPA and that we not conduct an audit this year. That is a substitute motion because that changes things completely. Now, uh, they, these motions are treated differently. A motion to amend uh, amends the basic motion. A substitute motion replaces the basic motion. So let me give you an example. There is a motion to have a seven-member audit committee. Someone else moves a, and duly seconded a motion to make it a ten-member committee. And then someone else makes a motion that we hire a CPA and not do an audit. You vote on the last motion that is on the floor, in this case the substitute motion. If that motion were to pass, the other motions are moot. The basic motion in this case, the motion to amend, they're moot. They're off the table. They're done. And you just implement the substitute motion. If the substitute motion were to fail, you go to the next motion on the floor, which is the motion to amend. If that were to fail, then you go to the basic motion. If that were to pass, you still go to the basic motion now as amended. And if the basic motion passes, that's what you implement. That's the scenario. Now let's talk about the issue of debating or not debating. The, the basic rule of debate and discussion is that all motions are subject to debate or discussion. That's the rule. Like everything else in parliamentary procedure, there are exceptions. These exceptions are a motion to adjourn. A motion to adjourn can be made, ladies and gentlemen, at any time in the meeting. Any time. However, you may not interrupt a speaker. And if a motion to adjourn is voted down, it may not be made again until an item of business has been handled and resolved. Otherwise, you'd be making motions to adjourn again and again and again. Uh, that is, an obstreperous member would do so. Um, now, a motion uh, to take a recess. That is not debatable. You vote on it right away, and if people vote uh, to do it, then you take a recess, just like you would adjourn. If it's voted on and passes, you adjourn. Uh, a motion to fix the time to adjourn. That's not debatable. You just vote on it. This, by the way, is a very useful motion. For example, it's 8.30 p.m. at night, uh, Mr. Jones makes a motion that we adjourn by 11 p.m. It's seconded, not debatable. You vote on it. If it passes, the body must adjourn at 11 p.m. So you've got two and a half more hours to uh, do your business. A motion to table, ladies and gentlemen, is not debatable. It also requires a simple majority. This is a very, very powerful motion. Very powerful. Uh, a motion to table is not debatable. You vote on it right away, and it requires just a simple majority to pass. Uh, you can do two, uh, motions to table in two ways. You can just table, or you can table an item to a specific date and time. If an item is tabled to a specific date and time, or a specific date, it must be taken off the table and put back on the table of the body on that date or on that date and time. If you make a motion to table without specifying the date and time it comes back, that motion is on or under the table and never comes back to the body until someone moves to take it off the table. Again, a very powerful uh, motion. And finally, a motion to limit debate. Uh, these are usually uh, called motion for previous question or you may even be a motion to limit debate. For example, uh, moving to cut off debate after 30 more minutes or moving to allow each member of the body only seven minutes to discuss the item. Those motions are not debatable. Now, uh, let's talk about supermajority votes. Again, there's a basic rule. All motions require a simple majority to pass. That makes sense. We are a democracy. Simple majority passes all motions. Again, there are exceptions, and here are the exceptions. The motion to limit debate. Uh, in other words, when you want to cut people off, either in terms of time or just cut debate off entirely, it requires a supermajority vote. 
a two-thirds vote. Now, a simple majority of a five-member body is three, but a two-thirds vote of a five-member body is four. So to cut off debate or to limit debate, you need four people if all five are uh, present. Uh, and the rule there makes some sense because you don't want to debate items forever. But if there's only one person that wants to keep talking about it, that person's going to get overruled. If two people want to keep talking about it, you're going to keep talking about it. A motion to close nominations requires a two-thirds vote. A motion to object to consideration of a question requires a two-thirds vote. In other words, you don't even consider the item from the get-go. Just cut it off. And a motion to suspend the rules requires a two-thirds vote. All these are supermajority votes, and when you think it through, they do make sense. Now, let's talk for a moment about a special motion. That is the motion to reconsider. Uh, this is a special motion, and it has special rules. Motions to reconsider require only a simple majority to pass, just like any other normal motion. However, it can only be made at certain times, and it can only be made by certain members. Who can make the motion to reconsider? Only a member of the majority. If a motion passes by a three to two vote, only a member of the three vote majority can ask to reconsider. Now, anyone can second that motion. However, only a member of the majority may ask for reconsideration. And as I told you earlier, it makes sense. Otherwise, a member of the minority could keep putting the item back on the table again and again and again, and you, you gotta finally come to a decision and move on. It can only be made at certain times. In my experience on city councils and board of supervisors, I highly recommend that motions to reconsider only be made at the same meeting at the same meeting. So later in the meeting, a member can make a motion to reconsider. It becomes more problematic if it's made at subsequent meetings. Uh, if it's made at the next meeting of the body, you gotta make sure that all the proper rules of notice have been followed. Uh, and I'd never allow a motion to reconsider beyond the very next meeting. But rule of thumb, the best time to make a motion to reconsider is at the meeting where the item was first considered. Now, let's talk a moment about courtesy and decorum. Let's not lose sight of the fact that we are public entities and public bodies, and we are there for the public uh, and with the public. And so the public doesn't want to see members of the body sniping at each other or interrupting each other or being rude to each other or in other ways just being impossible. So it's important that we create the right atmosphere. And that means no personal attacks on people or motives. Don't interrupt each other. If you want to attack a person's ideas, fine. Disagree on the substance. Disagree on the concept. Um, have debate on the proposal. But don't attack the messenger. Don't attack the person. Don't be rude to the person. Certainly don't interrupt the person. Treat each other with courtesy, respect, and decorum. It's also important that we proceed one person at a time. Possibly the most important rule of all is one speaker at a time. And so it's important that you be recognized. Find a way to be recognized by the chair or the mayor or the president. Uh, agree amongst each other how you will do that whether it's by saying Mr. Mayor or Madam Mayor or by raising your hand or in some other way being recognized. Once you're recognized, then you speak until someone else is recognized. Uh, raise points of privilege or points of order when you need to do so. Uh, remember the appeals process. If you disagree with the chair, you can appeal the ruling of the chair. The rule of thumb is the chair has the final word on parliamentary procedure, protocol, process. However, the chair can be overruled if the body overrules him or her. Uh, let's talk a moment about withdrawing a motion. A maker of a motion can withdraw that motion at any time except after discussion and debate and after the restatement of the motion 
just before the vote. At that point, the motion no longer belongs to the maker, it belongs to the body. It can no longer be withdrawn. At that point, it has to be voted on, yay or nay. But up to that point, even during the debate, the maker of the motion has the right to withdraw it. However, another member of the body, perhaps the seconder of the motion, may wish to make the motion, and if it is seconded, then it is back on the floor for discussion and debate. Finally, let's talk about public input. I have three rules of thumb for public input. Rule number one, tell the public what the body will be doing. So important, keep the body, keep the public informed. Let them know what you will be doing. Ladies and gentlemen, this is item number 42 on the agenda, uh, street repairs. What we're gonna do first is hear from uh, staff. They're gonna give us a report. We'll ask for technical questions of clarification from the, from the council. We will then open it up to you for public discussion and debate. Then we'll close it, have discussion uh, on the body, and we'll take a vote. In other words, let the public know what's gonna happen. Rule number two, keep the public informed while the body is doing it. It's real simple. The chair or the mayor or the president simply says, all right, we've now had a staff report. Are there any questions of clarification? Hearing none, we're now gonna move to public comments. I'm gonna limit the members of the public to three minutes each. In other words, let the public know what you're doing, where you are in the agenda. And finally, rule number three, when the body has acted, tell the public what the body did. You and I both know we've been at meetings where the body has acted and people are walking out of the meeting saying, what, what just happened? What did they do? Would someone tell me what they did? Well, it should never be that way. Make sure if you're the chair, the president, the mayor, you tell not only the body, but the public, but also the secretary who's keeping the minutes exactly what it is you just did. Ladies and gentlemen, we passed the city budget of $2,500,000. Uh, uh, thank you very much. See you next year. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, the presentation of Rosenberg's Rules of Order. By the way, you can find Rosenberg's Rules of Order if you will go to the internet. Uh, you can type in www.google.com, type in Rosenberg's Rules of Order, and you'll see it on the internet. Also, it's on my website, www.daverosenberg.net. Uh, Rosenberg's Rules of Orders are there. You can also get it through the League of California Cities. Uh, they allow you to purchase it, but as I say, you can get it free of charge by downloading it from the internet. I hope uh, you have enjoyed this presentation. And finally, we have one last slide. Uh, it took a lot of time to prepare this last uh, PowerPoint slide. And so wait for that presentation and enjoy it while it lasts. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Did anybody else get that Dave Rosenberg email? Or All right, thank you. At this time, I don't know if we have comments or um, any other word on along this uh, topic of you, uh, Rosenberg's Rule of Orders. Did you get that list, uh, www, Dave Rosenberg, the end of that? Did you get all of that address? I believe that was www.daverosenberg.net. Dot what? Dot net, N-E-T. Thank you. All right. With that said, then, um, since there are no questions or comments, uh, I'd like to go ahead and move on with uh, general commission comments. Um, uh, I, uh, if I may. Uh, yes, sir. I uh, wanted to bring up uh, a matter that I believe uh, had 
been discussed before. Uh, uh, there was speeding and uh, difficulty of crossing uh, uh, the parking uh, from one side to another at, at the uh, San Fernando Park. Um, I, I guess there, there is no stop sign. There's only a, cro a crosswalk with visible lines and so forth, but uh, I, I would hope that we could uh, uh, put it on the agenda for discussion for uh, uh, the next time uh, we meet, if that would be okay with the city. And also I wanted to congratulate our, our new uh, uh, commissioner uh, and uh, vice chair as well. Uh, hopefully uh, 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 she's not uh, disappointed because of my not preparedness this time, but um, uh, I promise you going forward, uh, I, we will be in order here. Thank you. Commissioner um, Adriana. Thank you. You can call me Gay. Um, I, what? That'll be fine. Adriana? Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I just wanted to say I appreciate the opportunity to serve with all of you, and I'm uh, looking forward to participating in meaningful, meaningful discussion. Um, and I am sorry I'm not present there, but I will be present at the next meeting in person. Thank you. Next, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, first, I just wanted to clarify with staff, I believe we are all allowed to attend in person now, correct? Staff? Yeah, that is, it, we can't attend in person. I think, you know, the, the option still exists for, for members to attend uh, virtually as well. So, but yes, now we, we can have all in person. I think it's just, uh, I think I, I believe city council is considering that again at the March 7th meeting uh, to extend that, whether to extend that another month. Got it. I was just asking for clarification yes. on that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and also welcome to our new commissioner. Welcome, Vice Chair Adriana Gomez. We're so fortunate to have you. I look forward to getting to know you. And then finally, I wanted to ask about two days ago on the city social media page, there were posts about the new SoCal gas project. Um, I was hoping that we could get a timeline according to the social media post, it, and I admit I haven't actually driven down there to double check it, but apparently it was closing as of the 28th. Um, how long, it says it's, that it's Park Avenue from 1st to 5th, how long will Park Avenue be closed for? Approximately, do we have any idea? Right, so the project with the gas company is approximately two months. Okay. Um, then my comment would be that perhaps we should um, consider not agendizing the stop sign issue on that for another two months. That's my comment. Thank you. Commissioner D. I don't really have very many things to say, but congratulations, Ariana. I hope we can still meet on Tuesdays once in a while for that uh, uh, little gathering. And uh, it's nice to have you on board. And it's good to have you back, Rudy. Um, you've got a lot of experience now under your belt. So if you need help, we'll all pitch in and help. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I, I guess um, my comment, um, 
I think I'm also going to echo um, Commissioner Arizona's uh, comment as it relates to, I think once we get past the um, work that's gonna be done on Park Avenue, um, it is gonna create a lot, a lot of uh, parking issues. Um, as it is, we do see plenty already happening. I, one of the um, uh, community members, residents, did bring my attention um, and hopefully after all the work is done that we could eventually uh, put it on the table to speak about um, possible blinking lights at that crosswalk that our commissioner made um, reference to. Um, only because we have so much activity going on. So also I'd like to just say that I'm hoping also to be able to have our new chief to um, hopefully uh, appear on our commission and just to, I would love just to hear uh, his uh, thoughts on community policing, community engagement, in particular as it relates to um, juvenile justice and all that we see uh, taking place uh, all around us. I, that would be my comments at this point. What I'd like to do is go ahead and give it back to staff communication. May I, may I add something to uh, uh, Pastor Rudy's uh, comments about the chief of police? We're going to have him at our neighborhood watch meeting. And if you want to know the time and date of the neighborhood watch meeting, I will email that to you so that you have it. And you, he's going to be here to talk to the citizens in the neighborhood watch people. And we'd love to have you. And I, we would love to have you bring anyone else that would like to meet the chief uh, here to uh, see what he's all about. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Staff communication. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, so on top of that, Gus Company working on Park Avenue, shortly after that, we're going to start our San Fernando uh, Regional Park infiltration system, which will also affect traffic along Park Avenue. Um, there will be possible closures, um, delineation of traffic along Park Avenue between 1st and 5th, 5th Street between Park Avenue and Jesse Street, Jesse Street between 5th and Glen Oaks, and a portion of Glen Oaks uh, between Griswold and Jesse Street. Uh, we expect this project to, to begin sometime in April or May. Um, while the gas company completes their job or their work um, along Park Avenue. All right, if there be no further staff communication, then uh, I would like us to, I'm sorry, go ahead. I have a question, may I ask a question? Absolutely. Is there a timeline for that? project, the infiltration project? Uh, we're looking at um, April 2022, um, and that's about a one-year project. And each section will be cl closed for, like, not the whole time, but? Not the whole time. Um, but the first phase is to install um, interceptors in, on different points of the uh, route. Second phase is to install a pipe, also in the, in the right-of-way on the street. And then also uh, part of the construction phase is to actually work on the uh, baseball field at Recreation Park. Uh, that last portion will not uh, affect traffic that much other than traffic along First Street, which has already been closed off um, on the eastbound lane. Sorry, on the westbound lane. Yeah, and I'd just like to follow up on that as the right now the contractor is um, working on finalizing uh, their submittals uh, for the project, including a project schedule. And there'll be a number of um, community outreach events uh, during March uh, to educate the community on, on the work that's been going on, as well as the schedule at different points in time. So that'll all, as that schedule gets finalized, that'll all be communicated on the city's website, uh, as well as through other opportunities we have and social media and just kind of keeping everybody up to date on the work that's being done. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Moore, on that question. We have any other commissioner uh, questions along um, 
the updates. All right. Then at this time, I'd like to adjourn. I'd like to, I don't know if we got to take a vote on it. I believe we do. So I'd like to um, adjourn this meeting at this time. So do we need to move forward and uh, get a motion on that, or we just go ahead and adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. All right, thank you. Thank motion you. being made uh, to adjourn March 2nd. Second. Second. The meeting. Thank you. Chair Trujillo? Yes. Vice Chair Gomez? Yes. Commissioner Trujillo? Yes. Sorry. Commissioner Arison? Yes. Commissioner Moore? Yes. Commissioner Aikman? Yes. All right, this will adjourn. Thank you, everybody, and thank you once again for the nomination. I appreciate it. Wishing you all best of luck and safe journey, Adriana, as you take your flight out. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate right. it. Bye-bye, everybody.